But Claudia, what what will that do for the big data industry? Ooh. The same thing that's done for the, the, the current market of uh, cloud. that American clouds have sold so poorly in the European has been because there are no European clouds. You're well aware of the fact that GDPR is very strict about um, having the data within the European Union. It's a very sort of... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so but, but they have data centers, even here in Sweden. No, they, they've done that afterwards. I mean, when, when GDPR came in force, uh, a good example is Microsoft. They only had, as I understood it, in 2015, was the time that they initiated the first German uh, sort of data center. 2018, no, they had no, to no, implement... No, sorry, sorry. no, 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 no. They, 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 they had uh, Azure data centers in Netherlands, uh, UK, Ireland, uh, much before that. But what you're, what you're referring to in 2015 was when they gave, uh, they created an Azure data center that is not operated by Microsoft. Correct. by about the German company. German company. So it is not in the jurisdiction Correct. of American companies. Thank you. That's exactly what I was saying. So that was the first time that was initiated. And then in 2018, now finally Microsoft has one in Stockholm and one in Umeå now that they're going to be operated by an independent uh, body to confirm. And... There's a lot of talk about artificial intelligence and it's a threat against privacy. But can you use AI to help privacy? Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, is it a threat to privacy? I would question that in the first place. Uh, because the threat to privacy in this case is that the information architecture is bad. You, you're still collecting a lot of information and then you, you apply AI as an analytics tool on top of it and can quickly extract the information. But the challenge in the first place, why did you collect that information? Because AI is just a tool to make it faster. But if you can find the information that you're not allowed to have with AI faster, you're still collecting information that you're not allowed to. So yeah. that would be the first thing yeah. to address. So that's the ethical part of that's AI? Eth yeah, well, both the ethical and legal part. Yeah. So AI is just a tool. You, you could argue that uh, speed limits wasn't a problem 100 years ago when people didn't have cars. Then when you go with their horse and carriage, the problem wasn't that uh, big. And now they, I would have to say the horses have played it very well. They used to be horse and carriage. Now it's actually a car with a horse uh, in the carriage. Yeah. So they play that one very well. But nowadays we have speed limits due to that the laws of physics when we crash is actually could kill, it, kill us. And that's the same thing when it comes to AI. When we have a huge amount of information, legal or not, but it takes quite some time to analyze it, most of the information would get old, old wouldn't be usable. Now comes AI. Now we could find this information very fast. Now we see that, okay, there's a lot of information that we shouldn't be allowed to aggregate or analyze. So it's, a, it's the same thing. So I, I don't see AI as a threat to privacy in itself but it would visualize that we need a lot more rules and regulation on how should, are you allowed to uh, store, uh, collect and store information. GDPR. So big data is going to have the same kind of impact on, on, on when it comes to collecting cookies and administering cookies. At the moment there are a lot of uh, companies um, uh, making profit and uh, capitalizing on the idea of cookies. And this is where the law comes down to. The law has sort of two sort of balances. One is to protect, and the other one is, of course, to... Uh, Enable. Exactly. So, and here is where it comes. And you have to... Uh, interesting point of view is that one of the basics of the European community is that we should have the free movement of goods, services, and uh, money. People. Exactly. So how does that sort of... Uh, caters within this sort of point of view. And the, the but but, but I, I think the problem is that if there is no protection, people will never trust the system and, and, and the value will not be generated because people will give bogus answers to questionnaires because they know it will be misused, right? That's a general... Uh, um, uh, my, uh, my personal opinion on this is that I think you're right. Uh, 
uh, a lot of people have what's called uh, 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 a secret identity on the net, and then they have the real identity. But I think more and more people are coming into pace with the fact that having this fake identity doesn't give me the services that I need. I need to be identified to get the proper services. So I think a lot of um, laws and regulations are going to be around how to protect somebody that is vulnerable and gives out their information to companies about themselves. I think that's where it's... Looking at the next part, could it actually be beneficial for us? Yes, uh, taking the exact same tool, we could see what type of... So we could actually ask a company that are using AI uh, that what type of information do you have about me? And then we could see, well, you actually, may, you actually have too much information from a GDPR perspective, and I could pinpoint that to them. So I could actually use their tools against them. So that's a good thing provided they actually give the information they have, and that's another yeah. thing, but that, that's legal ethical again. So something very interesting was that the value of data has been decreasing. There is a huge deflation in, in, in data value. Okay. So for instance, uh, remember 20 years ago when everybody was going to be, get rich on, on, on graphical, uh, geographical information systems? Okay, now I see what you're saying. And now all of this is for free. Uh, we have the same thing with, with record data about uh, people mm -hmm. that used to be expensive. Now it's available for free from, from the government and so on. So lots of, of, of the value of data is decreasing rapidly. It's like photos. It used to be, it used to be like only photographers could take photos 100 years ago. And now Correct. everyone takes yeah. photos. So many photos. I mean, how many photos do you have in your account? Correct, Who knows? Correct. And they're very good, actually. And the quality has always been increased, and you get yeah, tools so the, that so, make it so easy. So you have all this data, but it's less and less worth. The, 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 the monetary value, the emotional value is less and less. So why, why does it even need to be protected? When you see attacks nowadays emerging on different type of malware, and th that is, if I remember correctly what I read, it takes about 10, 15 minutes after a malware first used and detected that it's actually blocked by uh, at customers that are using those this type of service. I know there they are the uh, uh, in my browser there's this smart screen, smart screen filtering, where it actually blocks known malware and it taps into the security graph and the AI engines that is working with that. So that's one way where we see AI could be a lot of beneficial. Uh, looking how AI can help us. AI could, for example, be very, very fast in identifying a different, different type of new attacks. And depending on the information you actually store and collect. I think this is more to do with innovation and perception of innovation. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're well aware of uh, John von der Bush, the uh, sort of inventor of the system uh, sort of schematics and things. I think in the 70s he wrote this very interesting uh, book about system design. At the time it was something very sort of popular. Uh, he predicted a lot of sort of inventions and he made a prediction around them. For instance, that television was revolutionized the whole educational system. That didn't turn out to be the fact. Uh, so I think, in, in, and this is why I'm saying, in the 90s, uh, I worked with date document management all the time. One of the big things about knowledge management at the time was how do we capture it? How do we lock it? How do we keep it? It was very interesting to see how they, it was all about securing it. Whereas today, it's all about how do we release it? How do we spread it? So I think data comes to be sort of being very valuable when you had this idea that it needs to be confined, locked. It's, it's, it's an asset. Whereas now, when it's free, then it no longer has this potential value on its own, but it still keeps the value for the company. The company always wants to know who they're dealing business with and why they're doing business with them. So but, I think that's where it's going. So, but isn't it better if we live in a panopticon where everything is freely available? We have, uh, we have talked about unethical behavior from companies and using AI, but what about criminals? Can they also use these tools? They not only can, they do. They, they are in the forefront. There's so much money in cybercrime today that I can't even name the figure. I think it's about, I think it's about 2.1 trillions a year, I heard, so 20 zero or something. Uh, it's a really large number. So they are 
actively using this type of information to extract. But they are mainly finding ways of threatening you because there's a lot of money in trying to expose different type of information. The challenge would be that today we see uh, th there's one scam going around where they use uh, information from old hacks or username and password. And most people haven't changed their password, so they actually send you a mail with, this is your username, this is your password, and I've activated your webcam and I saw what you did, your dirty bastard, whatever they yeah. write. And the challenge comes here, especially if you post it, you know, if you are taking more private pictures, and those are connected to your IP. So they actually have found the pictures you thought you stored securely on your phone yeah. and that and connected that to this type of hack. Yeah, so then there would actually be a real that actually would expose your type of information. Yeah. All the information. All the information would be free. Free uh, no well everything is visible. You know what a panopticon No I don't know please so it, a panopticon a panopticon is a, a, a prison uh -huh. uh, where the guards see everything. So there is a, a famous panopticon prison in Cuba. Okay. Where all the all the cells are open, they're they're built in a circle, okay. and all the cells are open, and the, the guards sit in like a tower in the middle, yes. and they see everything. Okay. So uh, panopticon is a, a, a... is pan everything and opticon yes. see, so right. seeing everything. So it's a society where everything is visible. Exactly. Because okay. right. if you're not hiding it, it can't be leaked. If you're not hiding it, you can't be leaked. Mm. Um, I think the, the, the problem with data is that data is not a static sort of entity, uh, especially not for businesses. There's always a life cycle. You initiate uh, a relationship with a web page by clicking around there. They don't know exactly who you are, but as we spoke earlier, they have a persona or, or a, a, an idea who you can be. Then you decide to make this purchase on the website. Then you identify yourself, then they have the data about you. Then you purchase already the data and you become, uh, uh, your loyalty will be sort of uh, rendered sort of, according to, for instance, GDPR, one year after you consume something, then you need to revoke that sort of person from the database because it's no longer. Automated blackmail. Automated blackmail. That will be the first case where we see it. And we will also see, we, and we also actually see how people, how hackers get access to LinkedIn and review your private information and target attacks. So, like, for example, uh, there is what we call the CFO attack, where they target the CFOs on different type of companies and send them a mail that, that they just need to reactivate their Microsoft Office um, a subscription, they click on that, and one of the things that happen is that it pop, pops up uh, your webmail, you log on, and they, they don't take your credentials, but they only insert a mail forwarding rule. So all the CFO's mails is sent forward, and sooner or later there will be contacts to the bank. Then they will craft a PDF, send it to the bank that looks exactly as the documents the uh, CFO is sending already, but with a payment somewhere else. So. Automating this type of attack with AI to extract the information, extract the mails, and did. so we will see more attacks faster. And the way of managing that is in the same way as always, start looking at how could we secure the identity, the identity platform, and the underlying infrastructure. If you secure that, you block those types of attacks. And so that, that's how it goes hand in, hand in hand when we talk about AI. So AI will enable things faster, but will also enable a lot of other things like uh, self-driving cars or like the type of robots that Isaac Asimov has been writing about for many, many years. Yeah, so. Needed. Uh, so I think, and this is, I think, the problem with the data as per definition, I think when people talk about big data, they forget that there's always a life cycle within the data. There is never something called a static data. because. When, when data becomes static, data dies. It becomes archived. Nobody wants to talk about it anymore. But the moment, it's what, what I call living data, it always is within an ecosystem. And that ecosystem is generally driven either by people or processes. So my point of view, and it's always what I said, that I think data has a value, but only when it's active, when it's done something sort of positive. 
some regulations but also some protection from the bad guys? Yeah, I would say what we are actually looking at is that when it comes to AI, uh, we should be looking more at uh, DRM, mandatory DRM systems that will actually say all my information is protected always. And the only way a company could access to that is to, for me to allow it. And then they should be allowed to decrypt the information for that specific use. Mm -hmm. So looking at the extension of uh, GDPR, nowadays I give my consent yeah. to them accessing the information, but they get a copy of my information. Yeah. And then they could use it how they will or let it be hacked yeah. or whatever. I would say that we are looking at a future with some type of DRM or other type of function. So I would have to allow access to my information every time. Mm -hmm. So they can't only use it when they ask me. Mm -hmm. so, so you're saying that, that would, what we're protecting is the activity around data more than anything else? I think that's what we should be protecting. At the moment, we are protecting so much the data, the subject. But that's because the legal, as you said yourself, is slow. It, it, it's, it's always reactive. It's never sort of... So, so I think the next step will be the processes around data that need to be protected. So, Claudio, I, I think we should go to the bookstore so I can show you the uh, uh, book I was talking about. Let's do that. Thank you.